Uh, hi, I'm Samantha Church. I'm a singer, songwriter, and street performer out of Charleston, South Carolina. What brought you to Southern California? Um, well, my mom and sister both live out here, and uh, the tour season in Charleston is just, it's completely dead in the winter. Um, so I figured it was a good time to come see my family and kind of reboot and uh, get a new audience. And yes, yeah, so that's pretty much what I'm doing here. How long have you been? Um, I've been here for a little over a week now, but I'll be here through the end of March. Great. And and uh, what have you discovered? I know it's such a short amount of time, but what have you discovered so far about the, the music scene? Um, well, I haven't had a chance to go out to the clubs yet so much. I've been mostly just performing on the street. And uh, I performed here in Long Beach and in L.A. Um, and in Hollywood. And, uh, you know, it's... I don't know, I, I like it because it's a really, it's a, it's more tough crowd than Charleston, it's, you know, but it's uh, a lot more people, the weather's a lot better, and you really earn it, you know, like you have to really convince them, so it kind of makes you up your game uh, quite a bit, but, I mean, so far, the best thing about it is that there are so many other musicians and people uh, in the industry, so everywhere you go, you're meeting people who are doing what you're doing, and you're not, you're not the weirdo <laughs> among everybody. So that was, uh, I don't know, that's, that's been a really great thing. Growing up in uh, the South, what was the music scene like in your home? Was there music going on inside your home? Oh yeah, I mean we, we, I mean, we didn't just live, we moved around quite a bit. I spent uh, high school and college in Charleston and then moved away for a bit and then came back recently. But uh, um, yeah, my sister plays clarinet um, and saxophone and drums and my other sister plays uh, uh, saxophone and trombone and bass guitar and uh, and we all sing and um, yeah so it was really artistic household in general like I studied theater growing up I went to uh, Charleston County School of the Arts uh, for high school and then I studied theater at College of Charleston um, and you know we all write and play music and it's just a weird bohemian house <laughs> that I grew up in. Did you and your sisters perform together as a group? No, no, we we're loners. <laughs> Even if we all do the same thing, we were all doing our own projects. Um, but uh, but yeah, I mean we you know we'd sing around the house, but we yeah we didn't really perform together. Interesting. So um, when you were um, first picking up, what was your first instrument? My first instrument was flute, um, mm -hmm. and that was I started playing that in uh, middle school. But then when I went to school of the arts, uh, if you studied one thing, you had to focus entirely on it. So I had to, to study theater, I had to give up music for uh, while I was in high school. Um, so I didn't play anything for a long time, and then I was on the track to be a theater actress. And um, But then after I got out of college, then I started singing backup in bands just for fun. And, um, and I picked up a banjo about four years ago, uh, and that was my first stringed instrument, and I just kind of threw myself at it whole hog and uh, yeah I, I started street performing like three months into playing before I really knew what I was doing so that makes you you know pick it up a little bit faster when your livelihood depends on it so. right and there's a I think there's a pretty big difference between playing music and writing music how did you come to doing that I mean when I was doing theater I was I mean I've always been writing and I uh, I wrote a lot of plays um, uh, when I was doing theater and you know the the writing process I think is it's pretty much it's pretty similar for all mediums you know you're just trying to build tension and find ways to release it and then um, you know you want a beginning middle and end you want things to have kind of a circular motion to them and have it you know have a, a good pace and you know build to a dramatic climax but like the pacing and all that that's all pretty similar so then it's just a matter of finding the right poetry and um, uh, trying to, you know, get at the heart of the matter much faster in song. So it's, I, I really do think of it kind of like writing plays. They're, you know, just little three-minute 
monologues. Mm. So, so do you find that your work is more intellectual uh, in that that it's not coming from your own life necessarily, but maybe your own creative processes well, rather than like coming from your gut? Your gut? Um, no, no, it definitely comes from my gut, and it is it is personal. I try to make it universal as well, but. Um, I mean, that's probably the hardest transition, is uh, going from doing something that is more fictional um, to doing something that is deeply personal and confessional. Um, so really when I say it's like monologues or like plays, it's more like I've got, you know, I'm having this feeling. So I've got to, I, I, I want to tell somebody how I feel, and I'm doing it in song. And the initial feeling is what gets me going, but then it's all then it does become an intellectual exercise of trying to make it fit the form. Um, and, uh, uh, yeah, just, by, by the time I'm done with the song, I've pretty much worked out my feelings, so, <laughs> yeah. And the busking scene, uh, it must be different uh, back east. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, although I haven't, honestly, I haven't seen too much of one here, which kind of uh, surprises me, even in, even in LA, even on Hollywood, I thought there would be, there's a lot of costume characters, but I haven't seen a lot of musicians yet. I've seen a few, but, um, but in Charleston, it's just, you're mostly performing downtown, which is a very small, compact area, um, and you're, you're definitely, like, a big attraction, because it's the only thing going on. It's like, what is, you know, what is that? Um, you know, here it's a, you know, you're fighting for more attention, and the sound quality is not as good because the buildings are real close together in Charleston, so it bounces. And uh, um, but at the same time, you're less of an annoyance <laughs> to people because it's not as loud. So um, yeah, I mean, I would just say it's kind of a tougher scene here. There's a little bit more competition, but it's not necessarily with other. I haven't found so much competition with other musicians on the street here. Um, I lived in Chicago for a long time. Uh, that's where I started busking, and I did that in the subways, and that was an entirely different thing than Charleston or here, because in the subways in Chicago, you have to, uh, there's only three legal spots to play, and there's, I don't know, 100 street performers that have, we have to schedule ourselves, and that was, that was a really intense uh, territorial kind of atmosphere, but, and it was really pretty tough, um, but it definitely made everything else seem a lot easier <laughs> starting there. But it was also good because you had everybody's attention for five minutes. Like, right. you're the only thing going on. They have to give you a chance. Whereas on the street, they just, if they don't want to pay attention, they don't have to pay attention. So, so you were busking here last week in mm -hmm. Long Beach. Um, what was that like? Long Beach is really, it's a really nice, receptive audience. It kind of reminds me of Charleston in that way. It's, it's a, you know, it's not, it's a little bit more laid back than uh, performing in Hollywood or something. And, um, yeah, everyone's just really friendly and laid back and uh, generous, which is nice. And I was performing outside of uh, uh, Made, and they they seem to really like street performers. I actually was out here last year, and uh, I already knew them because I performed in front of their store then. And I follow uh, the Long Beach uh, busking group on Facebook, and uh, they're frequently posting to have buskers come play. So it's always nice when you're invited and not you know, <laughs> just hoping nobody says anything. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, one of the things that Long Beach has struggled with was how the city views busking. And over the last couple of years, that's changed to be a little bit more relaxed and accepting. Uh, there was a point when you had to do, go through a permitting process, mm -hmm. and that was found eventually to be not only impractical, but illegal. Yeah, yeah, it's gone to the Supreme Court a couple times, I think, and it's uh, uh, you're uh, it's considered free speech, so uh, you're not supposed to, you know, uh, you're not supposed to have permitting systems. But most cities do uh, mm. that I've found, and you know, it's really at the end of the day a matter of you know you can fight it in court and be like you're not supposed to do this, but there's no busker with the money to do legal fees of that kind, so. Um, yeah, but, you know, it's always nice when a city does relax on it a little bit because, honestly, I, I think it's, busking helps tourism. It, it lets people know they're in a big city with arts happening and whatnot, and, you know, of course nobody likes it when a busker isn't any good, but you don't like it when anything isn't any good. So it's, you know, you got to take the good with the bad, and, um, 
and when the buskers are good, it's it's something that really you know that people really delight in. It's a fun little surprise for them. So so it's I don't know I I really appreciate it when cities are welcoming to it and try and find ways to work with buskers uh, rather than just say you know how how do we get rid of this these you know this riffraff because <laughs> it's I don't know it's a it's a really wonderful way to get art out there in an unfiltered way without any sort of you know bottom line you can it it's communicating directly with an audience and the best thing about it is that nobody's nobody's telling you what to like you get to decide for yourself you know do I like it do I not do I pay for it do I not it's nobody's manipulating you it's it's just with any sort of advertisement it's just the thing and you get to decide if you like it or not so I don't know, it's a really democratic uh, way to perform, I think, and uh, make your living at it. That's great. Uh, do you have uh, plans while you're here to do any um, non-busking gigs? Yeah, I, I plan to hit up as many open mics as I can. I, this past week I've just been kind of getting settled in, but I've got, I've got two months um, here and I want to hit all the open mics I can and get to know the club owners and whatnot that way. I don't have anything on the books. Um, mostly because part of what I'm doing here is, uh, and part of what's great about True Performance, again, is trying to build up an audience, you know. I, I, it's hard to book a gig when you have no draw in that city yet, so, um, so I'm kind of just making an introduction while I'm here and uh, trying to work up that audience, and hopefully I'll have some gigs booked by the time I leave. But. And what about recordings? Do you have any, like, recordings that you've... you've yeah, heard? if you go to uh, samanthachurch.com, it takes you, uh, redirects you to my band camp, and uh, I have uh, an album, an album that is like a studio-produced album, and then also uh, some demos for things that I intend to record uh, pretty soon. And uh, even just in the last week, I've met people here that have studios that trade recording time, um, you know, it's the thing I love most about LA is just people get things done, you know. Uh, they All the resources you need are here, so I definitely intend to record while I'm here. And uh, yeah, uh, I have about two albums worth of songs, so I'm going to have to pare it down. <laughs> um, the album that you recorded, mm -hmm. um, where was that done? Uh, that was done in Chicago at uh, Dimension Studios. Um, and uh, Nathan Rogers was the producer, and uh, he did a he did a really good job with it. And yeah, did, was it you a solo, or did you have support? It was just it was just me, and then uh, for a couple of the tracks, a uh, drummer I know uh, named Joe Chelman uh, filled in just a little bit, and then we used we used a little bit of um, you know of drum tracks and whatnot uh, done in the studio. But mostly it's just me. Anything you hear instrumental on it is is me, and uh, we wanted it as stripped down as possible, um, while still giving it like a full uh, a full sound, because um, we wanted it to kind of mirror what you'd hear on the street, and um, yeah, uh, and not make it something that is completely different from what you would hear. Because I'm 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 out there by myself, and I try and make my songs in a way that they can be done with just one person. So. Yeah, it's, it's pretty stripped down. It's mostly me, a little Nathan, and a little uh, Joe Chelman just helping out. One of the things I think that, that Mick, who introduced us, uh, noticed right away about you, and I think, I, I think anyone who, who hears you perform will probably notice, is you have this amazing voice. And I was just wondering um, what it was like to come into that voice. What was, what was your... Did you have influences that you were drawing on, or was this just something innate in you that... Um, both. Uh, growing up, I listened to a lot of soul music, and uh, um, also my best friend's mother was a gospel singer, and uh, uh, she would sing around the house, and, uh, you know, kind of, I feel like she, she and her daughter, my friend's sister, uh, Linnea, kind of taught me how to sing when I was little. And then for a long period, I just, I, I gave it up in a weird teenage rebellion because uh, my mom was always trying to get me to sing and I was like, I don't have to sing, and I just didn't sing for years like an idiot. Um, but then I started singing back up in bands and I never really, um, I never really, I never really thought much about my voice. It was just like, oh yeah, I can also sing, um, until I started singing with bands and, uh, um, and then I started dating a blues musician and we went to all the really awesome blues clubs on the south side and um, heard some really amazing stuff and uh, 
uh, got it, you know, I, I, it started to give me the bug of wanting to make my own music and go out on my own. And uh, yeah, and then when I got the banjo, the banjo informed a lot of how I sang. Um, so a lot of it was kind of an organic thing. And it's been interesting for me to hear how my voice has changed over the years, because when I was a kid, I you know, was doing theater, uh, so there was a bit of musical, musical theater about my voice, and you know, for a while I was into jazz, and it sounded kind of jazzy, and then over, over time it's, uh, it's just, yeah, it's morphed with my influences, but I think the thing that's probably shaped what my voice is now the most is the banjo. Um, it just, I sound different when I sing by myself than when I do with the banjo, so that's, that instrument gets full credit for my voice. <laughs> what do you think that is, though, that, that relationship? Why does your voice change when you're... I mean, I think it might be because I'm focused on the banjo. Um, I mean, it's newer to me than singing, and also, it just, I don't know, you're, it's like any time you, you're basically playing two instruments at once when you sing and play at the same time, so it's like any time you jam with somebody, you're gonna be trying to match their sound and, you know, get into a, a groove with it, and, uh, yeah, so when I play with the banjo, it's, it's the kind of, I'm jamming with myself, I guess, is what it's like, so I, uh, yeah, so I just, it just, it changes it, and it's, it's just listening to what I'm doing down here, and, uh, um, and then just kind of naturally getting in tune with it. Uh, this song is called uh, I Don't Belong.